Ladies and gentlemen, Fatima Cigarettes is proud to bring you its prize-winning radio program, winner of the Motion Picture Herald Fame Award. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to juvenile bureau. You receive a complaint about an eight-year-old boy and his sister. A neighbor reports they've been going from door to door begging for food. Supposedly, the children are from well-to-do parents. Your job? Investigate. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, April 27th. It was overcast in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Kinsling. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from communications. It was 4.38 p.m. when I got to 1335 Georgia Street, second floor, room 14. Hi, Joe. Been waiting long? I was just checking with records. No, I just got here. What's this thing all about? Well, just what I told you on the phone. Seven-year-old boy and his sister covering the neighborhood begging food. You ready to go? Yeah, let me put this away first. All right. Kid's supposed to be from a wealthy family, huh? Well, wealthy enough to live in the best part of Bel Air, yeah. Mm, doesn't make much sense. Must be some kind of a gag, huh? No, not according to the neighbor who called in. Yeah? She says the kids are half-starved. Ben and I got in the car and drove out Sunset Boulevard to the Bel Air District. We pulled up in front of a large two-story home near the corner of Brookline Avenue and Knightsbridge Drive. It was a white frame colonial mansion set back in the middle of well-landscaped lawns and gardens. The other homes in the neighborhood were just as large, $50,000 and up. It was the last place in the city that you'd expect to find neighborhood children begging food. 5.20 p.m. We went around to the rear entrance of the colonial mansion as we'd been instructed on the phone. We located the woman who'd called in the complaint, a Miss Jeanette Bajon. She was employed as laundress and cook by the owners of the house. She was busy fixing dinner. They're from next door, officer. The children. As I explained on the phone, a boy about seven years, a girl oh, five years old, I guess. Which side do they live on, Miss Bajon? The house on the corner? Uh, no, the other side. Up here. The brown and white house, just up the street next door. Mm-hmm. Are the children there now? Do you know that? No, but they were here this afternoon again. Here to the back door asking for something to eat. I do not understand it. Something must be wrong. Well, have they been around often, Miss Beja? Oh, two or three days, maybe four days. At first, I thought they were fooling, but they were not. I gave them some cookies, sandwiches. They were very hungry. They ate them like they were starving. The little girl saved her cookies. She took them with her. How about their parents? Are they at home? Excuse me, what's that? There, that's there. No, I haven't seen the mother the last few days. I understand they are divorced. The mother, she lives there with the children. The father, I don't know. Well, what's their name, do you know? Kessler. Madame, the woman I work for. 
She says there are three children in the Kessler family. But I don't know. I have only seen the two, the boy and the girl. I would go over and see what is wrong, but I do not know the Kessler. It is not my place. That's why I called you, officer. All right, Miss Page. I will thank you very much. Oh, not at all, officer. You understand, I do not mind giving the children food. Well, I think only something is wrong if they do not get it at home. Well, thank you very much for notifying us. We're going to check into it. Well, I'm just a little curious, Miss Beige, huh? What's that you're making? This? Napoleon. Uh, how's that? Napoleon. You know, Napoleon pastry. Oh, oh, yeah. Sure smells good. Well, thanks again. Oh, certainly, officer. If there is anything I can do, you will let me know? Yes, ma'am, we will. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Beautiful place. Yeah. Those Swedish women make pretty good cooks, don't they? I don't know. She sounded French to me. Huh? Maybe so. Most good at cooking, anyhow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that brown and white house next door, that must be it, huh? Yeah, that name, Kessler, they fairly prominent around town, society? I don't know. There's quite a few of them. Could be. Any way you look at it, it's hard to figure, isn't it? Kids have been at it for four days. If it's on the level, they really must be in a bind. Garage door is open back there. No sign of a car. Mm-hmm. Kids' bicycles, though. Let's try the front door, huh? Mm-hmm. Guess you better try it again, huh? Yeah. Yes, sir? Hello, son. Your name's Kessler, is that right? Yes, I'm Richard. My mother's not home right now. Maybe you can come back tomorrow. Well, we're police officers, Richard. If you're not busy, we'd like to talk to you for a minute. Is that all right? Oh, yes, sir. That'd be all right. Would you come in, please? Thank you. Richard Kessler was a blonde-haired, wiry boy, polite, well-mannered. He told us that he was eight years old and that he attended the neighborhood grammar school. He showed us back to the kitchen where he was warming a can of soup that he borrowed from a neighbor. It was a large house, richly furnished, but it hadn't been cleaned for weeks. Dust was piled up thick on the furniture, and children's books and toys were scattered around the rooms along with scraps of dried bread, half-eaten. The house was cold and musty. On a small bar in the dining room, there were three half-filled cocktail glasses, a plate full of cigarette butts. Evidently, they'd been standing there for days. On the sink in the kitchen, there were a few pieces of stale bread and an open bottle of milk that had turned sour. Next to it were a half a dozen empty whiskey bottles. The Kessler boy was well-dressed, except for the shirt that he had on. It looked as if he'd been wearing it for a week. What did you want to talk to me about, officer? I haven't done anything wrong. Oh, we know that, son. We'd just like to find out how you've been getting along. Well, I've, been, I've been getting along all right. Two A's and four B's on my report card last month. Mm-hmm. Where's your sister, Dick? Judy, uh, she's down the street. She'll be back in a minute. How about your mother? Where's she? Uh, she's out, too. She'll be back. When do you expect her, son? Pretty soon, He's coming back pretty soon. Well, your sister, Judy, she's younger than you are, isn't she, Beth? Uh, yes. Judy's only six. I'm eight. Any other grown-ups live here with you besides your mother? No. Mom takes care of us. She'll be back pretty soon. We'd like to have you tell us the truth now, Dick. How long has she been gone? I don't know. It's probably important. It's taking her a long time. She can come back tomorrow. She'll probably be here then. When was the last time you saw her, huh? Son, how about that? A couple of days ago. Well, this is Tuesday. You mean she left the house Sunday? No, before that. Last Friday night she went out. Said she'd be back. I don't know. Did your mother say where she was going, Dick? No, her boyfriend was here. Larry, I don't know his last name. Mom went out with him to a party, I think. I don't know where. She'll be back all right. Well, did you leave anyone to take care of? No, we can take care of ourselves. Nobody fixed the cooking, though. I don't know how yet. I'd better look at the soup on the stove. No, I'll take care of it, son. You go ahead. Sit down. Has your mother ever left you like this before, son? Maybe once or twice. She never stayed away this long, though. I don't know. What's the matter, Dick? Well, Johnny, officer, my little brother. He hasn't eaten much for a while. Must be hungry by now. I was fixing the soup for him. Yeah, well, where's Johnny? He's upstairs in the nursery. He's been sick with a bad cold. Mom knew Johnny was sick. That's why I wondered. She hasn't come back yet. I don't think Johnny's feeling good. Do you want to take us up to the same side? Yeah, all right, if you want. Ben, you want to come on? Yeah, uh mm-hmm. 
How long has Johnny had this cold, Dick? A couple of days before Friday, before Mom left. Mm -hmm. How old is he? Johnny's just a little kid. He won't be two years old until July. I've been wondering about him. Coughed a lot at first. Been given him milk and cookies. That's what Judy and I had. I don't know. Has a doctor been to see Johnny? Oh, no, I thought of calling him. I didn't know the doctor's name. I was waiting until Mom got home. Oh, this is Johnny's room here. Mm -hmm. In the crib, officer. That's my brother Johnny. Mm -hmm. Pretty cold in here. Hi, Johnny. You hungry now? Yo. Look at his eyes. Yeah. I want to get to a phone, doctor, and ambulance. Tell him to hurry. Right. Oh, what's the matter, officer? What about Johnny's eyes? He'll be all right, Dick. Oh, he's been acting awful quiet, but hardly moved around at all. Most of the time, he's jumping up and down in his crib like anything. Has anyone at all been in here to see him since Friday? Yes, sir. My sister Judy and I, we changed his diapers and give him something to eat. I see. I sure wish Mom would get home. I'd like to talk to her. Yeah, so would I. 5.48 p.m. We put in a call to the office for a policewoman, and then we got in touch with Lieutenant Lee Jones at the crime lab, and he sent out a man to photograph the condition of the Kessler home and the children. The doctor and the ambulance arrived, and little Johnny Kessler was taken to the general hospital in critical condition. The 22-month-old boy was in a coma. Richard Kessler and his sister Judy were taken to Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau and then transferred to Juvenile Hall and placed under protective custody, Section 700, Sub B, Welfare and Institution Code. The two of them were given a bath and something to eat. Judy Kessler was interrogated separately by a policewoman. Ben and I talked to the boy, Richard. After a few minutes, he broke down and admitted that his mother had gone off and left the three children alone on at least a half a dozen occasions. He told us his parents were divorced. He rarely saw his father but his mother had had two or three boyfriends at the house during the past year. He also told us his mother drank quite a bit. But she's never been gone this long before, Sergeant. Maybe she's out somewhere and has no way to get home. We'll find her all right, son. Don't you worry about it. Well, this boyfriend of your mother's, Dick, his first name was Larry. Is that all you can tell us? Yes, sir. I don't know his last name. Are you going to keep us here all night, Judy and me? Just for a day or so. They'll take good care of you, son. Where did you take Judy? Well, she's just next door, Dick. You can see her in just a minute now. And, uh, how about Johnny? I always take care of him. Pretty fussy around strangers. Well, they've got him over at the hospital, Dick. They're going to take good care of him now. You can count on that. I don't know, officer. i better see him. He might get awful fussy. All right. We'll fix that up for you. Do you have any relatives in Los Angeles, son? Aunts, uncles, anyone like that? No, just my father. But I don't know where he lives. Well, we had a nurse who used to take care of us, Mrs. McIntosh. She was swell. My mom fired you. Oh, how'd that happen, do you know? No, I'm not quite sure. Maybe my mom was drinking. Mrs. McIntosh got mad at her. Had a big fight, and mom fired her. Oh, well, this Mrs. McIntosh, you know where we can find her? No, sir, I don't. How about uh, some of the other boyfriends that your mother had, Dick? Do you remember any of their names? No, one of them was George something. I don't remember the other one. Joe, see you a minute? Yeah, Max. You want to stay with the boy, huh, Dad? Yeah. Hospital call. It's a lousy thing. Well, what's that? The Kessler boy, little Johnny. Yeah? He just died. John Albert Kessler, white male American, age 22 months. All the pertinent facts and data would be listed on the crime report. And if and when the case was closed, the report would be filed away. Wouldn't be any different from a thousand other dead body reports. Same size, same color. Same number up in the left-hand corner. In the course of 10 or 20 years on the job, a police officer sees a lot of them. Most of them he forgets. Few of them he never forgets. The next morning, the body was posted to the county morgue. It was found that the youngster had been suffering from malnutrition, but the cause of death was listed as a basal skull fracture. Homicide detail was notified. The search for the mother, Mrs. Jean Kessler, went on. We talked to her neighbors, all of her friends that we could locate. We checked out an address book that was found in Mrs. Kessler's effects at her home. We got out a broadcast and an APB. No luck. Thursday, April 29th. How about the youngster's brother and sister, Ben? You think it could have happened that way? How do you mean? Well, we were taking care of the little fella. They might have had an accident with him. They're afraid to own up to it. I don't think so, Joe. No, that's not very likely, Mac. We talked to him quite a bit last night. 
couple of pretty honest kids. Pretty sure that they wouldn't lie about something like that. Where does that leave it, the mother? Good possibility. We know Mrs. Kester drinks quite a bit. She could have lost patience with a little boy. More chance of an accident there. I get it. You and old Friday. Yeah, Bert. Where's that? Uh-huh. Right, thanks. Yeah? Woman answering Miss Kessler's description checked into the hotel down on South Hope last night. Still registered? Well, she checked out early this morning. They found a woman's sport coat in the room. What about it? Blood stains on it. You are listening to Dragnet for the step-by-step solution to tonight's authentic case history. Here's step-by-step are the actual reasons why Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette. Why in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos, the finest domestic and Turkish varieties, extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture, smooth, round, perfect cigarette. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Compare Fatima yourself. Fatima's now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Start enjoying Fatima quality yourself. Insist on Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Friday, April 30th. We were still without a lead as to the whereabouts of the missing mother, Mrs. Jean Kessler. The blood-stained coat which had been found in the South Hope Street Hotel was shown to Mrs. Kessler's friends and to her children, Richard and Judy. They identified it as belonging to the missing woman. Routine investigation of the hotel room failed to uncover any further leads. We got out a supplementary APB, and then we started rechecking with the Kessler woman's friends and acquaintances. Nothing. We rechecked a dozen taverns and cocktail lounges that she'd been known to frequent. No sign of her, no sign of her boyfriend. In rechecking her personal effects, we found a canceled check payable to their former nurse, uh, Mrs. McIntyre. The endorsement carried her address. We checked it out. She'd moved. We traced it to the forwarding address. There we were told that she had a new job as a nursemaid with a wealthy family living in the Los Feliz district. We called there and talked to Mrs. McIntyre, and she told us that she was just leaving the house with the three children for an outing at the park and the zoo. We made arrangements to meet with her out there. 1.30 p.m. Ben and I located her at the head of the path leading through the main part of the Griffith Park Zoo. I read about it in the paper, Sergeant, about Johnny. I didn't know you wanted to talk to me. I would have called in if I did. We're still trying to locate the mother, Mrs. McIntosh. Can you help us out there at all? No, I don't know. You asked at those places she used to go to all the time where she used to drink. Yes, ma'am, we have. They couldn't help us. Did you know any of Miss Kessler's boyfriends, the ones that had come to the house? Yes, I knew all of them. Donald, don't you wander off now? Same for you, Patsy. You stay close. Uh, the boy, Richard, uh, he was telling us about one of the boyfriends, ma'am. A fellow named Larry. Oh, yes. Donald, you heard what I said. You stay close. Yes, I knew Larry. You remember what his last name was, ma'am? Yes, Bartell. Some kind of an actor in the movies, I think. Larry yeah, Bartell. You know where he lives? No, I think he had an apartment in Hollywood. I wouldn't know the address. Uh, what kind of a man was this Bartell? I mean, his temperament and things like that. Well, I think he was kind of lazy. I think Mr. Kessler was giving him money. Mm-hmm. Did the two of them ever argue or have any fights? All the time. He had a terrible temper. Did he ever strike Miss Kessler? Yes, I saw it happen several times. Not too close to the cage, Donald. Back a little. How did this Bartell act toward the children, Mrs. McIntyre? Different, I guess. They annoyed him sometimes. Well, that was after that you had the argument with Miss Kessler? Yes. It was about her drinking and the boyfriend and all the rest. I just got sick of it, and I told her what I thought. She didn't want to admit she was getting old, not caring for the children, pretending she was still in her 20s. It's... Well, do you have any idea where we might locate the father? Well, they're divorced, you know. He's a head salesman for a lumber concern downtown. He inherited most of his money. 
I have the name of the company at home. You can have it if you like. Yes, ma'am. We'd appreciate that. You know, it's the children I feel sorry for. Yes, ma'am. Three beautiful children. And that poor little Johnny. I just can't understand. What's that? How could anyone desert a helpless baby like that? We'll ask his mother. Friday, 5 p.m. Mrs. McIntosh called us at the office and gave us the business address of the missing woman's ex-husband, Richard Lane Kessler. We called there, but they told us Kessler was away on a week's vacation. They had no idea where to contact him, but he was expected back in a few days. We called Central Casting and asked them to check their talent list for a bit player by the name of Larry Bartell. They had no such name listed. Saturday, 8 a.m., the Kessler children, Richard and Judy, remained in the custody of juvenile authorities. The search for their mother continued. All day Saturday, Ben and I ran down what few leads we had. They went nowhere. Checks of the morgue, the city hospitals, and the drunk tank at the main jail still failed to turn up the missing woman. We checked again at the different drinking places she used to patronize. No one had seen her. 5.30 p.m., we went back to the office. Not a mileage today. Yeah, there's not much to show for it. Not going to be much fun for those Kessler kids this Sunday. Why? What do you mean? First Sunday in May. Huh? Mother's Day. Oh, yeah. Hi, Mac. Hi. Got a piece of news for you. Yep. The Kessler woman's boyfriend, Larry Bartell. What about him? He's been located. When he'd seen his name mentioned the previous night in the newspaper stories concerning the case, Larry Bartell had contacted the office to let us know that he didn't consider himself a fugitive. At least that was his story. He called just a few minutes before we got back to the office. He left word that he could be found at a Wilshire address all day Sunday. In the meantime, he'd be at the Spotlight Club, the club for theatrical people located in West Hollywood. 6.25 p.m., Ben and I located him at the club back in the billiards room. He was tall, dark-haired, dressed expensively. I told the cop when I called in, you weren't supposed to contact me. It was important. That little Kessler boy is dead, Bartell. We think that's pretty important. Well, I didn't know anything about that. You didn't have to interrupt me. That's an important man I was playing with. Now, what do you want to know? Where's Miss Kessler? Well, why ask me? I don't know. You're a pretty good friend of hers. You were the last person seen with her. Oh, it was a week ago. We went out to a party last Friday night. I haven't seen her since the following Monday. Uh, yeah, last Monday. I'm through with her anyway. What do you mean? I just got sick of her, that's all. Pawing all over me, asking me to marry her. I just got sick of her. It wasn't worth it. You accepted money for her? Just to tide me over. She had plenty of it. Why not? Where'd you last see her? Keep your horses on. I wouldn't like to stop. get around the club. Yeah. There's yeah. a hotel downtown on South Fall. I'll like to the address. Were you at another hotel with Miss Kessler last week? Mm, yeah. Yeah, on South Hope, around 9th Street, I think. Oh, that's where you found a coat, huh? You got an explanation for that? Blood thing? Sure. Crazy day. So I threw her, then she tried to hit me in the bottle. Cut herself. Well, I tell you, this wasn't worth it, that's all. I guess you can prove everything you're telling us, huh? Of course I can prove it. It's the truth. Then what about the little boy? How'd that happen? I didn't have anything to do with it. It wasn't my fault. Well, how'd it happen? Well, that Friday night just before we left the house. The old lady and I were downstairs having a few drinks. She put the little kid to bed, but he wouldn't stay there. He just getting up out of bed and running downstairs crying. Yeah, go on. Well, ah, she finally took the kid, gave him a good spanking, threw him back in bed. I think he hit his head in one of the posts of the creek. Why didn't she do something about it? Well, I told her, but she said it was nothing. Didn't matter. Got a coach once, that's all. Kids are all right when we left. You mean all the times you and Mrs. Kessler went out, you knew those children were being left all alone in that house? Oh, what out of cheese? The mother, not me. Oh, look, I gotta get back. I kept that game waiting on. Just a minute. It's gonna wait a little longer. Come on. Larry Bartell was taken downtown and held for questioning on suspicion of 702 WIC, contributing to negligence of minors. He gave us the address of the hotel where he'd last seen Mrs. Kessler. Ben and I checked it out. It was a typical cheap downtown hotel with a bar opening off the lobby. The desk clerk told us a woman answering Mrs. Kessler's description was registered in a room on the second floor. They had an old-fashioned player piano going full volume in the bar. The sound followed us up the stairs. Tenants here sure must like their music. Yeah. Back to there, isn't it? 216? Yeah. Police officers would like to talk to you. I haven't done anything. 
what he wanted me. I want to talk to you about your children, Miss Kessler. But I didn't do anything. Johnny was sick, that's all. I didn't do anything. That's not what Bartell says. Larry, have you seen him? Is he coming back to me? You better get up, lady. Get your coat. I gotta have Larry back. He's everything to me. I love him. Is he coming back? You've been gone over a week. Aren't you a little worried about your children? They're all right. I'm too young to spend my life on children. I need Larry. Where is he? See if you can find a coat, will you, Ben? Yeah, all right. I've been drinking off this. I felt terrible. Yeah. I need Larry so bad. He's young like me. I love him. I gave him all my love. Gave him every bit of it. Yeah, you gave him too much. What? You didn't have any left for your kids. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, if you're with us week to week, you've heard me say, in Fatima, the difference is quality. It's a difference that you can prove just by buying a pack and smoking them. You'll find Fatima's extra mild with a rich, better flavor and aroma. Stop in at the store in the corner and buy a pack of Fatima the first chance you get. You'll find in Fatima's the difference is quality. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for your very fine response to our program, Dragnet. Since the first show went on the air about a year and a half ago, your cards and letters have been a constant source of encouragement and guidance. In the field of radio presentations, we felt that we were attempting something a little different, and we were not altogether sure that it would meet with your approval. Possibly... We were sure that our approach to this type of presentation was a sound one, but the final approval had to rest with you. If we may judge by your response, you've placed Dragnet high among the programs that you enjoy most. For this, we're indeed grateful. We've tried to bring you, first of all, an adult program worthy of the 30 minutes that you spend with us each week. We've tried to bring you an honest and authoritative report on the work of your police force. We've tried to bring before you documented police cases that were informative as well as entertaining. In forthcoming weeks, we sincerely hope that Dragnet remains one of your favorite shows. Your letters have been read by all members of the Dragnet production staff. So if you like to listen to Dragnet, it's because you, our listeners, have helped to guide us in presenting the kind of entertainment that you want. And for this, our thanks. Mrs. Jean Kessler was filed on and found guilty in Superior Court, charge of manslaughter. She was sentenced to one year in the county jail and deprived of the custody of her children. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Now stay tuned for Counter Spy, then it's Screen Director's Playhouse on NBC.